Hi there, this is the Common Magician with another experiment. I've got a deck of cards here. It's a regular deck of cards. The cards are shuffled and mixed. However, uh, I would like you to shuffle them. And again, this is a kind of a hands-off sort of experiment. Uh, I would not touch the cards, but I'll do the um, work here uh, on your behalf. But I would turn these over for you to uh, shuffle. You can shuffle as much as you want uh, until you're content that they are thoroughly mixed. And then I would have you set the cards down. And then I would ask you to uh, cut the deck uh, anywhere that you like. You can cut shallow, you can cut deep, wherever you like. Uh, just cut uh, the top off and set it right here. You would do that, and then I would say, that's wonderful. Go ahead and complete the cut. Uh, and this would all be done by you. This would be hands-off. The performer would not touch the cards. This is just something uh, that uh, you as the spectator would do. And then I would ask you a simple question. Um, I'm wondering if there happens to be any card that you might be thinking of, any card that you might be uh, thinking of in your mind, um, just the first card that pops into your head. You might say something like the Ace of Spades or something like that. Uh, and I would say, that's interesting. That's very interesting you would think the Ace of Spades. I was thinking of something different, um, uh, but I was thinking of another common card. Uh, in fact, the card that I'm thinking of right now, I actually carry with me all the time. Uh, in my wallet, uh, you would see here that I have one card, just one card on me, just that one right there. It's the only one that I have in my wallet, uh, this one Queen of Hearts. It's a very popular, well-known card. Uh, and uh, I don't know why I carry it, but I just carry it around with me. And this is very interesting to me because I'm curious to see what you cut to. Now, I just want to remind you that you shuffled the deck. Um, you handled the deck. I did not. You cut the deck. I did not do it. You did it. Uh, go ahead and turn that card over and set it right here. And you would turn that card over to reveal that you indeed cut and shuffled to the Queen of Hearts. From Expert at the Card Table, there is a section in here. This is a public domain uh, book, public domain text. You can download this for free in ebook or PDF format, or you can purchase uh, one of the many publications of the book that are out there. Uh, there is a section uh, called Indicating to Indicate the Location for the Cut. To Indicate the Location for the Cut. And uh, one of the first subheadings is, this is located by the crimp. Okay, this is located by the crimp. Um, later on in the book, there is another section uh, which deals with, um, you know, dealing with spectators uh, when, or rather, uh, other people playing a game, not spectators, I should say, this is about gambling, uh, but dealing with other players when you are alone and cheating in a card game. That's what Expert at the Card Table is really about, is about card cheating. Um, and there's a section here, uh, when you're dealing alone, uh, it's called Crimping for the Cut. Crimping for the cut. And what it says here is the probability of the unsuspecting player cutting into a crimp is always kept in view. Okay, the probability of the of the unsuspecting player cutting into a crimp is always kept in view. Now, I wanted to take a moment there to uh, look at a public domain text like uh, Expert at the Card Table uh, and, and just to look at those couple of locations in there talking about uh, a topic that we're going to deal with now. Just because I don't want to be accused of outing marketed effects. There are a, a number of marketed effects. One in particular I'm thinking out. I don't want to name it because I do want to be fair. Um, but uh, there is one out there that does a very similar thing to what, what we're doing here. And it very well may operate on this principle. I do not know for sure, um, but it may do this. Uh, the reveal in that effect uh, deals with a cell phone rather than a wallet. Uh, I'm sure that you can search that out and find it. Um, this is my take on a very similar uh, effect, a similar outcome, uh, with a couple of nuanced differences here that we're going to talk about that I think can make this performance a little bit better. Again, I don't really know what that particular effect operates on, but I would assume, uh, honestly, that it probably operates on something very similar to what we're going to look at here. Now we are dealing with um, uh, we are dealing with multiple outs. 
uh, in connection and in conjunction and in use with uh, forces. Uh, so forcing a spectator into a narrow uh, number of outcomes and then having multiple outs, various outs that you can uh, trace down and follow down uh, uh, once a, a force has been made uh, to complete the effect. And the benefit of doing this is that it's very difficult for a spectator to follow back when there's multiple outs to a force because they feel that they have real free control and choice over the matter. So um, I'm going to, though, put a couple of layers on this effect that can really plus one it. We can really make this a whole lot more powerful if you get lucky. Um, there is a little bit of chance in here that you can get very lucky and have what we call a perfect outcome. Uh, and that's going to be one topic of discussion is the perfect outcome in a magic trick or in, a, in a, an experiment, in an illusion, a setup. Um, and also I want to talk about uh, the other side of that, which is the worst outcome. And I just want to show you that the worst outcome does not need to be so bad if you plan for it. If you plan for the, you know, the, um, the scenario in which things don't pan out, you can still deal uh, with your, your setup and still make it work and still pull off uh, a wonder of amazement for people to... Um, to take awe in. So let's take a look at what's going on here. I have a regular deck of cards uh, with one exception. There's four cards here and you can actually you can use more cards than this if you want to. The higher the probability and the more outs that you have um, the better rather the better the probability this gets. Uh, if you have several outs uh, more than four uh, you know as we're using here then your probability is even higher uh, that you'll get a hit as we uh, we'll discuss in a moment. I'm using four force cards and I'm using these force cards and I want to talk briefly about why these four cards. You can use any cards you want but in order to get an extra layer on this I decided to use these and I would refer you to a very recent uh, Scam Nation episode that is Brian Brushwood's YouTube channel uh, where they revisit uh, Scam School episodes and look at new ideas even now. Um, and one of the ones that they, they did recently, he was talking about a 10-year experiment that was kind of unwitting. Uh, they did not intend to do this, but they came up with a 52-out card trick in which uh, a card could be thought of, and then there were 52 pre-recorded videos that uh, the spectator could be uh, directed to, one of those, and uh, there would be kind of this impossibility that there would be this video recorded that would predict the card that they were thinking of. Um, and in the process of, of doing this over 10 years, they discovered that they had a record of which cards were chosen and how frequently they were chosen. And they discovered that over a course of 10 years, the Ace of Spades was chosen most commonly, the Queen of Hearts was second, the Ace of Hearts was third, and the Ace of Diamonds was fourth. And there's some after that. They actually have the full list of all 52 cards and where they ranked, but these were the top four. And I thought, well, that would be interesting. If you use these as the force cards, uh, you could potentially put a thought of card layer to this and have a perfect outcome. Now, in addition to having these cards, uh, I have them marked. So each card is marked by what it is. I'm not going to talk about the markings. Just know that they are marked, and you can mark the cards any way you want. If you're just using four force cards, you can just put a, a particular spot on each one to note that it is the identity of you know the, the card in that particular order. Um, uh, I have these marked actually for number and suit. Uh, the whole deck is not marked, but just these cards in this case. So I have marked cards. These are the force cards. Uh, and then I have one more um, aspect of these cards that we have to discuss, and that gets to uh, the expert at the card table uh, sections that we looked at, and that is the use of crimps. These cards are crimped, uh, and these are breather crimps. There is a little divot that is placed in each one uh, right in the center so that it has sort of a convex, uh, a concave, I should say, image on the center and a convex image on the back. Uh, and uh, as they sit, if they were to sit on their back on a flat surface, these cards would spin fairly freely uh, with that uh, little impression on that. So let's take a look at how we're going to use this. So the setup would work like this. We would take our four uh, force cards. Again, you could have more as long as you have an out uh, designated to each one of these cards. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but you need to have an out for each one. 
Uh, and what we want to do is I would recommend that you space them out in the deck such that the more likely ones that people would think about, probably the Ace of Spades, the Queen of Hearts, are more central um, in the deck. So you want to space them out evenly, but I would put probably the Ace of Spades uh, in the middle and uh, a little bit off center, and then the Queen of Hearts about, I don't know, one fifth away off center. Then I would put uh, the Ace of Hearts probably closer to the top. I think people are more likely to cut shallow and cut deep, and then the Ace of Diamonds in the bottom. Now, ultimately, when they go to shuffle, this order is going to get mixed. Um, but when people shuffle, particularly overhand, um, they really end up just kind of reversing the order of cards in, in packets rather than really mixing them. Uh, so if I were to shuffle overhand like this in packets, I would still keep... Um, the cards relatively spaced out. Now I have one that went to the bottom, um, but I still have cards relatively spaced out, one, two, three, uh, with one right in the middle. And uh, the one in the middle is going to be my Ace of Spades. It's still rather, rather central. Now if I were to um, do this again, I would more or less kind of come back close to where I was at the beginning. Okay, so now the problem with this is that the more that the cards get shuffled, the more likely it is that, that unnatural gaps are going to be made in the deck. Okay, so you don't want uh, them shuffling too much, but, you know, maybe model once overhand and then give them an opportunity. Now, after the shuffling, I'll just note that the way I ended, I actually ended with a force card on the top. That is a very common outcome uh, when shuffling with overhand shuffling with a crimp. Um, very often a crimp will come to the top rather naturally. And since there are four of them in there, there's a high likelihood that that could happen. So when they're done shuffling and they set the deck down, you'll note your markings. And if there is a crimp card on the top, you don't need to really go any further in terms of procedure. You can just leave the situation just like that. Now here is where I have the first layer, the first out, and the, the, this out is what I would call the kind of the perfect, the perfect outcome. Um, this particular outcome is where you ask them to think of a card, and there's the off chance that they might be thinking of, because you have four popular cards in here, they might be thinking of the card that is on the top, okay? So again, um, you know, they shuffled. And, you know, there's a good chance, again, I've cut, you know, I've, I've shuffled one to the top that is a crimp. A crimp automatically landed on the top. It's a very likely outcome. You know, I would have them think of a card right now. Uh, and they might be, they, they might say, you know, the Ace of Spades or, or the, you know, the Queen of Hearts or something. But let's just say we get lucky and they say, in this case, the Ace of Hearts. The Ace of Hearts. And I know that that's what's sitting on top. If they say the one that's up there, Queen of Hearts, Ace of Spades, Ace of Hearts, Ace of Diamonds, if they say whatever it is, what I do is I ignore this wallet sitting here. I just It's just sitting there. It doesn't really mean anything. And I say, that's fascinating. That's very interesting that you would think of that particular card. Because I'm curious what you shuffled to. Um, why don't you go ahead and turn over that top card and set it right here. Now, there's a reason why I say set it right here is that this is a pad or you would do this on a table that has a tablecloth or something like that. I don't really want them turning the card over on the top because uh, you might get this spin to happen. Uh, if you have them lay it down on a, a softer surface, then the card won't spin. It will just sit there. And indeed, the card that they were thinking of is the Ace of Hearts. That is the perfect outcome. We'll note that is the perfect outcome. Uh, and I think there's a sense in which we should probably have, with our multiple out scenarios, uh, the possibility for the perfect outcome. Um, because, hey, you can't be perfect. Uh, you know, if, if you have them think of a card and they shuffled and cut to the card that they were thinking of, you can't get more powerful than that. That's a really, really good trick. And to pass that off as if you intended that to happen... Um, is a reputation maker, uh, absolutely, 
absolutely would be a reputation maker. You would be known for that. Um, so that's a perfect outcome. Now let's let's take the more more likely outcome. Is not not that they're thinking of the one. I would say what you know what card pops in your head. They might say the Ace of Spades. I know this is the Ace of Hearts. I'd say that's that's interesting. That's a card that a lot of people think of. Um, Maybe they'll say three of diamonds. I don't know. They say three of diamonds. You say, that's interesting. I was thinking of a very different card. In fact, I, I keep a card in my wallet. Now, I just want to note that you shuffled the deck. You cut the deck, whatever the case may be. We'll talk about cutting in a minute. Um, but you did all the work, and I did not touch this wallet over here. However, you'll note that in my wallet uh, right here, I have one card and one card only. It's the only card that I have in my wallet. And it happens to be the Ace of Hearts. Now, I'm just curious. I'm just curious. After all the shuffling and cutting, I'm curious what card you cut to. Would you turn that card over and set it right there? And then, of course, they can turn it over to reveal the inevitable that they have cut to and shuffled to the Ace of Hearts. So that is the secondary outcome. That is the, the likely outcome, which is a multiple out based on a force based on these crib cards. Now, let's talk about cutting very quickly here for a moment, uh, and we'll talk about uh, the, um, the, the, the situation that you, you don't really want to have happen, but can happen, and that is that you just can't get to a crib card. Uh, let's examine that possibility here for a moment. So just very quickly to review, uh, the spectator would uh, shuffle the cards any way that they want. Um, if they do not arrive at a crimp card on the top of the deck, which we did not hear, you would have them cut. Now again, because of the spacing of the four cards that are in there, there's a very high likelihood that they would cut to a crimp card. Let's, though, assume that they did not, which we did not right here. Um, what you would do is very simply, you would have somebody else cut. You would say, that's great, that's a very good mix, why don't we have you cut over here? Or you could say, that's nice and mixed up, why don't you cut again? You can cut shallow, you can cut deep, cut anywhere you want, freely. And then you would allow them to cut again, and then they would place it. Uh, there's a very high probability, the more you try this, that you're going to arrive at a crimp card like we did right here. In fact, we did arrive at a crimp card on top. We have our, our Ace of Hearts right there. Let's, though, assume that you didn't arrive at one. Let's... Let's assume that once again, you came up dry. So that's two cuts and you came up dry. You have a couple of options. You could have someone else cut again, uh, or you can just kind of take control of the situation. Personally, I think if you have two cuts happen uh, and you come up empty, it's probably a good idea to just take control of this and, and convert to a different trick, really, a different kind of presentation. Uh, and really, all you need to do is get your hands on the deck and get rid of the idea that um, they are going to do everything by themselves. Uh, you can just reiterate the fact that they shuffled the cards, they cut the cards twice, there's no way that you could know what the order of the cards are. This deck is a thoroughly shuffled deck, um, and it has been properly prepared. And then you continue with a different feat. You say, now I just want to try something here. I found that when I cut the deck... Um, I can usually cut to the card that I'm thinking of. And you would say at this point whatever the card is. So um, it's very easy to cut to a crimp card, especially when you have many of them. It's very easy to do it uh, as the performer because they have a certain feel to them. Um, and again, I did, I did hit a crimp card right here. Um, the, it's simple the way it works. All you need to do, let me get to a, a place where there is none. All you need to do, I'll show you kind of from the side here, is lift up on the deck and give a drop. And wherever it seems to want to drop very freely, right, that is going to be a spot where there's a crimp. Um, so you lift up kind of the whole thing and then just let, release a little bit. And it will, it will almost always cut to a crimped spot. So you can almost find all of them in there uh, if you really wanted to, right? So there's one. There's two. And I don't know if we'll hit them all. It's, it's a little bit of a, a knack there. But I think we're going to do it, at least hit three of them. I don't know. There might be one more left up here. 
And uh, I think we missed on that one. That's not a crimp card, but we hit three out of out of four there. So you know you can you if you get through two cuts, if there's nothing there, um, probably the best thing to do is turn it into a different trick rather than a hands off trick. This is going to be a skill trick. You can, you know or at least the impression of some sort of skill. You can say you shuffled the deck. It's it's all mixed up thoroughly. I have found that from a shuffled deck, kind of like Maverick, right? The the TV character, um, you know, the movie character who who uh, wanted to be able to cut to an ace of spades at will from a shuffled deck. Um, you know, you have that ability that you're able to cut to uh, a card that you're thinking of. Uh, then you can cut to that location, and then you can call it out. You might even say, you might even pick up on your perfect out at this point and say, now, are you thinking of a card? Is there any card that you're thinking of? What card pops into your head, right? And they might say, whatever it is. And uh, if they don't, then you can obviously uh, go on and present. They might say, Queen of Hearts, you know, they might say Queen of Hearts or whatever the case may be, uh, and it, you know, it is the Queen of Hearts. They might say, you know, the Ace of Diamonds or whatever the case may be. It doesn't matter. If they call it right, then go with that. If they don't say, that's interesting, because I was actually thinking of another card. Not only that, but I carry that card in my wallet, um, and it just so happens to be this. So you can even use your wallet out if you want to um, at that point uh, for, I think this one here is Ace of Diamonds, right? So you could, you could do that. Um, that is what you do when things aren't working out. You just take control. You turn it into a different trick, uh, and you use your knowledge of crimp cutting to cut to a crimp. Okay? You don't have to rely on their unwitting uh, uh, tendency to hit it. You can just hit it yourself. Uh, it's actually very easy to cut into crimp cards when you know that they're in there. You just lift up, release, and wherever it wants to break, that's where you're going to hit it. Okay. Um, let's talk very quickly about the multiple outs. Uh, we have four cards in here uh, that resemble these other cards. It doesn't have to be the same brand. This is a different brand of, of card. But what I did is I put, um, I have a divider in my wallet. I put one card on this side of the cache on this side, and then I did the same thing on this side of the, the other side of the divide. There's a, a, another one, so Ace of Spades, Queen of Hearts, these are the top two. And then on this side, I put the uh, next two cards on the other side of the cache on either side of the divide. That way, what I can do is whenever I go for my card, I can fairly realistically make it look empty by just about any angle because the cache either hides the card or the divide hides the other cards uh, and it can look fairly uh, fairly authentic whenever I take that card out. In general you don't want to be flashing the, the wallet anyway. You want to take it out in such a way that you're hiding things um, but if, if that is seen uh, you should be fairly clean uh, by organizing in this way. Alternatively you could just keep them inside of pockets and be really really safe if you keep them in places where uh, you know that nothing else is going to flash. Um, but that is the multiple outs with the concept of a perfect uh, ending, a perfect outcome uh, where they think of a popular card and you happen to hit it uh, and also um, a contingency for when things don't go quite right. You can just kind of take control of the situation and uh, do it yourself. Uh, if you want it done right, do it yourself, as they say. So that is the concept here uh, for this trick in the series of uh, forces um, coupled with multiple outs. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope that uh, you put it to use, and I wish you the best of luck and happy magicking.